Hey everyone! As we continue to tour around the Cygnus constellation using the Astrotech AT-11580T, um, I think this is a good opportunity for me to talk about one of the topics that I actually don't see a whole lot of coverage when it comes to astrophotography and sort of how to make your images stand out from all the rest. And that comes down to framing your target. So with that being said, let's get on with the video and let's talk about framing. When you're trying to frame an object, um, it's really important that you study the object and you get an understanding of what focal length is required. And you kind of want to make sure that when you pick an object and you pair it with your, you know, your favorite telescope, that that object actually doesn't fill the entire picture because if it fills the entire picture, you really have no choice but to sort of position that, that target front and center of your image. And so that's, how, that's sort of how you end up with, you know, your image looking the same as other people's image with, you know, just different processing or different, or different acquisition um, settings. And for example, you know, if you were to use the uh, William Optic Space Cat 51 and you're trying to, you know, sort of position the Veil Supernova Remnant in a corner, you really can't do that because, um, first of all, uh, when you use the Space Cat 51 with an APS-C sensor side, which is what I'm going to be using tonight, it already sort of fills the frame. Um, so. If you just put it in the corner, then you just, you're just basically cutting it off. And that's not that interesting to me. Uh, same thing with say the Pelican Nebula using the Astrotech AT-115 that you saw in the prior video that, you know, it actually fills the frame. I, I, there's not much more I can do with it other than to place the Pelican Nebula front and center of my, uh, of my image. But if you can, you know, sort of study your objects, and figure out a focal length in which that object will appear smaller in your picture, but still retain good details, then now you have, you have room to sort of play around and position either that object or that specific feature um, in any different combination of you know, location within your, your image. And you know, when you play around with that and you combine that with an interesting background, you can have a very interesting, um, I guess, composition. I'm not well versed in photography, so I'm ho I hope I'm using the right word. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that you gotta pick an uh, you gotta pick an object or a uh, specific specific region that will allow you the flexibility to sort of position it in a different area of your image. So. In tonight's example, I'm going to be using my Astrotech AT-115 and my Canon 60D, and I'm going to try to image the Cygnus Wall, which is a region within the North America Nebula up in the constellation of Cygnus. And if I've done my research correctly, then the Cygnus Wall will probably take up one-fourth of the image and the rest is going to be filled with background hydrogen alpha gas. And that's another thing I want to point out. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that you pick a target or a region of the sky where there's a lot of background gas happening. Because going back to the Veil Nebula, if you were to sort of position either the eastern portion or the western portion of it in a corner or off to the side, then you just have the nebula off to the side because in the area where Cygnus, well, I'm sorry, where Veil is, there's not a whole lot of background gas that's happening. So if you place either portion of the Veil nebula off to the side and you just have the nebula off to the side with, like, with essentially uh, darkness of, uh, of space around it. Um, and the reason, and this is the reason why I picked the uh, the Cygnus wall because 
in that region, I know there's a lot of hydrogen alpha gas in the background. So I'm hoping that, you know, if I position the, uh, the Cygnus wall off to the side, I can utilize the background hydrogen alpha gas to help paint me a different perspective. Um, and who knows? I hope that tonight will work out. Um, one thing I am going to note is that uh, this is the week where we have essentially 100% full moon for a couple of nights. And of course, whenever there's a full moon, we have a clear night. So I'm going to image anyways, full moon or not. Okay, so before, uh, before we get to nighttime, you know, as I always say in my videos, it's always great to plan ahead versus being surprised during the moment when you're about to take an image. So what I like to do now is, sh is uh, show you guys how I plan my image for the night and especially when I'm trying to frame my target in a particular manner. So of course, I'm gonna do this by using Stellarium and uh, within Nina. Now, I'm not connected to my mount whatsoever. This is just, you know, me doing research on, you know, a good idea of what the night is gonna be like and how I may potentially wanna frame my, uh, my object. And, you know, like I said, it's always good to practice. So, I have both Nina opened up and Stellarium opened up. A uh, couple housekeeping things that we need to do within Nina first is to make sure that your Nina is talking to Stellarium. And you can do this by going to the options right here. And when you go to the option, you want to go into equipment. And for planetarium, you want to make sure that uh, you've selected Stellarium. You, everything should be default. Your local host should be default. Uh, for me, my port is 8090. Uh, for you, it could be different. And you can check that by going to, I think, Stellarium, is it? Yeah, configuration window. Um, and then you wanna go into plugins. Plugins, you want to, I believe is remote sync. If I'm wrong, then we'll just go to different. Uh, aha, I am wrong. Okay, so we'll get out of here. Uh, remote control. Let's try remote control. There it is. So yeah, if you go to Stellarium, you go to you go to your configuration window and you go to remote control. You hit configure and you want to check server enable. Uh, you want to make sure this, this starts up automatically each time. And for me, my port number is 8090. For you, it could be different or it could be something else. So just make sure that these two numbers. 8090, 8090 are the same. Then you want to make sure that um, your Nina is understanding how you want to frame it and how big your 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 image circle was going to be. So uh, for that, you're going to go. You need to go into framing, and you want to make sure that all of your specs for your camera are correct. Uh, you want to make sure that your 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 pixel your pixel width and height and your pixel size are correct, and that you know you enter in the focal length of your of your uh, your telescope. And I am going to go into that by checking, just googling the Canon 60D specs. So uh, 18 megapixel, I don't need that. Sensor size 22.3, 14.9 millimeters. Not all that useful right now, but this is what I want. I want the pixel dimensions 5184 by 3456. So I've entered that here, 5184 by 3456. And my pixel size is 4.3 micron. There it is, 4.3. And the focal length of my Astrotech AT115 is 805 millimeters. And once you've got that entered in, then you're, you can start framing or start playing around with the framing. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to minimize this, go into Nina, get rid of all of that, and I am going to search for North America. 
no, my keyboard isn't working. There it is. North America Nebula. And I'm searching for North America Nebula because as I said earlier, the wall of the Cygnus wall is within uh, the North America Nebula. And right now you can't see anything because it's still daytime. So I'm going to fast forward to tonight. That's good enough. And I'm gonna make sure that I'm using my telescope is Astrotech AT115 EDT, and I'm using a, they don't have Canon 60D, so I just, I just picked any APS-C sensor size. This is just an approximation, and I'm gonna move my, my square frame thing right here, because this is how, this is a Cygnus wall right here, and this is the coordinate that will go into Nina. So now I'm going to go back to Nina and I'm going to hit this button that says get coordinates from planet from the planetarium. Um, this will take maybe a few seconds. Um, and it should pop up pretty soon. Aha, there it is. So uh, for some reason, every, anytime you um, get coordinates from Nina, it's always like super zoomed in. So you need to zoom way out for yourself. And this square is exactly what you enter here. So if I were to change this, the square is going to look different, I think. There it is. Yeah. So just make sure that all of your, your camera specs and your focal length specs are correct. Go back to 805. And so I can also rotate this. That's very important. This is my, if you go to target and you go to rotation, you can rotate it. And I think this is sort of how I want to, so this is going to be, a, this is I think how I'm gonna image tonight. Um, of course, uh, when it comes to tonight, I might, I may change it depending on how it looks, uh, as on some of the test shots, but this is how you can frame it. And the way that this will then work, uh, Nina is going to use the information within this little square and do a place solve and it will place solve precisely to tell your telescope, I mean, to tell your mount where to go and it will also tell you how much to rotate it by to get this specific sort of orientation. And you can change that by, you know, right here, just slide around until you get the perfect framing that you want. And with that being said, nothing I can do now except waiting for the nighttime. All right, so uh, it's nighttime. It's about 9.45 PM right now and um, I'm going to try to show you guys exactly what I was practicing inside earlier in the daytime. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do, um, well, never mind the screen. So I use, uh, <laughs> I use Altair to uh, help me find focus for my telescope. But the first thing I'm going to do, I am going to go to Stellarium and tell it to first slew over to the North America Nebula. I'm going to bring it over here so that it's so that I have the wall, the Cygnus wall in the frame, supposedly. I'm going to tell the slew over there. And at the same time, while it's moving over there, I'm going to go to Nina and tell Nina to get the coordinates from Stellarium. And once it gets that, it should pop up here. Give it a minute. Um, like I said, this is going to largely depend on um, how fast your computer is. Okay, so as you can see, um, this is going to be my image square. Um, I'm going to move it like so. Uh, yeah, something like this. 
I'm gonna try to go for something like this. Um, and then once I'm satisfied with this, I am going to tell it to slew, center, and rotate. And I'm picking slew, center, and rotate because I want Nina to play solve the correct orientation for the way that I have, you know, the way that I have, I, I have uh, framed it. Um, if you don't care about orientation, you can just hit, uh, you can just go with the, the normal slew and center. But like I said, because I want it to get into the, uh, the proper orientation to the way that I like it, I'm gonna do slew and center and rotate. I'm gonna hit that and it's gonna do a thing. Um, I've set my settle time to be 20 seconds um, because uh, I don't find my HEQ5 to be all that stable, <laughs> to be honest. And I find that, you know, if I let it settle for 20 seconds, I have less chances of my play solving not working. Uh, but we'll see because I have all these lights on, so I may have to turn all these lights off and just do it and then, <laughs> and then skip this whole part and you guys just have to assume that I've got it. <laughs> So, we'll see. So it's now solving. Okay, awesome. So apparently you can still play solve with all these lights on, so that's good. Um, so this is telling me that I need to rotate my camera clockwise 30.19 degrees to get it into this orientation. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And this is why I always say, if your telescope has a graduated rotator, it's so useful because now I can just look at this. It's telling me clockwise 33 some degrees. So I'm gonna do clockwise 33 some degrees. Uh, let me turn the light on. Hopefully, um, turn this light off. Hopefully I got it right because I always confuse clockwise and anti-clockwise and I always end up, and I always end up, I always have to go back <laughs> to redo this part. So, okay. So I'm getting really close. It's telling me to go one more degree. So I am going to do just that one more degree or actually 1.84, so that's almost two degrees. I think that's, I think that's two degrees. Um, so I'm gonna let it settle for a bit because I did touch the, the imaging train. So I'm gonna let it settle for maybe five or 10 seconds and then I'll press okay. Or essentially when I'm done talking, like right about now. Okay, so when it comes to Nina, when it stops telling you to rotate your camera here and there, that means that you've, you've got it in the orientation that you want it uh, from this setup. And now all Nina is doing right now is place solving and slewing to the correct location in the night sky for this framing. And, um, yeah, so just more waiting. And I guess while we wait, this is a good time for me to talk more about Nina. And this is another reason why I really enjoy using Nina because it's so easy, so intuitive. Uh, there's hardly any jargons. Uh, when it tells you to rotate clockwise, you just rotate clockwise. And it's very intuitive to use. And so I just hope that, you know, if you guys are starting out with astrophotography, really just download yourself Nina and just practice it because there's so many features here that is extremely useful, whether you're a beginner astrophotographer or you're an advanced astrophotographer. And to this day, I think I'm only using maybe like 
10 to 20 percent of what Nina offers and that's enough to get me through any of my nights so I can't wait to like dive deeper into Nina and learn more stuff about it so yeah if you're new to astrophotography look into Nina it, um, it'll, it'll save you a lot of headache and um, all right I'm going to I'm going to turn this light off because it keeps failing my plate solving so I'll be back all right so I was able to complete my plate solving uh, turns out I probably did have to turn off the light because there was just too much um, too much ambient too much ambient light and um, anyways so I did my plate solving and I took a test shot now remember this is the framing that we're going after and we're gonna use this sort of a the wall the Cygnus wall here as sort of our, our point of reference and if we take a look at our test shot hopefully you guys can see it but it's really faint um, you can kind of see an outline of it right here and if we look at and let's remember the the five stars there one two three four five and if we go back to our framing if we sort of flip our our test image right side up we can kind of make out this uh this sickness wall right here and the five stars so i'm pretty happy with this framing and um i'm gonna settle with this and begin my imaging so i guess this is a good time for me to talk about my plan for the night now um we are dealing with the full moon <laughs> once again it feels like any time that there's a clear night it's a full moon but that's okay because there's actually not a ton of oxygen 3 data that I care about with this uh, with this region all I really care about is the hydrogen alpha and when I use my optimal L I almost said that the the brand new filter that I don't have L ultimate no uh, with my Optolon L extreme filter um, it, it will help me block out a lot of the moonlight to the point where I can still image um, and especially if the only data that I care about is the hydrogen alpha so uh, I'm not really too worried about the moon and even if I was uh, I, we've been so deprived of clear nights uh, in San Francisco that I don't really care I'm gonna image anyways so so the plan here is I'm going to do my five minutes uh, sub exposures using ISO 1600. Um, I can't use ISO 3200 anymore because uh, either my Canon 60D is getting too old or whatever the case is. I'm just I keep seeing bands in my images and I, I can't I, I can't deal with it. And I find that uh, ISO 1600 works a little bit better for me. So I'm going to go with that five minutes. Um, and I am going to program Nina to image until either the sun comes up or until um, Cygnus wall sort of uh, dips below my condo's building rooftop. So I'm going to get going. So I hope that you guys found this useful and I think when you start playing around with framing your objects or framing specific features that you want to highlight in your nebulosity I think it's a really cool way to you know be more creative when you're out here imaging the beautiful night sky and it's also I think it's a way for anyone to breathe new life to objects that you've imaged before you know like year after year you know when you image the same object you know you, there might not be a whole lot of changes but when you start playing around with framing and you can sort of position your object or that, that special feature that you want to highlight in a, in a different position I think that's really cool I think it really brings out a bit more creativity when it comes to astrophotography so I hope you guys found this useful and Oh, damn it <laughs> um, I, I'm seeing some clouds rolling in so I am pretty sure the final image that you're about to see will not be completed tonight 
um, uh, the good thing is because it is the full moon for the next couple of days um, and at the moment I don't really have a whole lot of other targets that I'm interested in so I'm happy to spend multiple nights to complete the Cygnus wall with the Astrotech AT-115 EDT. So with that being said, I hope you guys will enjoy the final image and I'll see you guys next time. Um, I wish you all good health and uh, clear skies everyone. Take care. Bye.